be talking this morning about a, a patient that um, was seen in your ophthalmology clinic with Dr. Warner. I don't know if Dr. Warner's here. She might be here. Well, hopefully she'll be in at some point. Um, so the patient had a di diagnosis of ocular neuromyotonia, which I'm giving it away kind of at the beginning. But um, the, the story is pretty straightforward. He's a 57-year-old a um, bookstore manager, he came in as a referral, and his chief complaint was that his eyes were not tracking well. And this happened three or four years prior, uh, where he noticed the left eye had frequent, in infrequent episodes initially of, of crossing inward. They don't last very long, only 30 to 90 seconds. Um, he has a sensation during these episodes that he can't close his left eye. Um, he f says it feels really tight, and, and he's noticed that it seems to happen when He's looking in the mirror, either combing his hair or shaving his right sideburn. Not his left sideburn, it's his right. Um, and uh, it was terrible, it was out here and down. No, it was, they were pretty symmetric. Um, but, but he was a really um, you know, uh, observant gentleman, so he, he took that to mean that it happened either when he looked up or looked to the right, um, and that's what he came in and told us. Um, and then these episodes had occurred much more frequently since that time, so up to the point when we saw them, they were happening up to 15 times each day. In between episodes, this has been starting to occur where he, his left upper eyelid has been droopier and droopier over the years. Um, he has also noticed that his left eye doesn't elevate well, and that's just been in the last year, um, even when this is not going on. And even between episodes, he started to have vertical um, diplopia. And this is both in primary and up gaze. It, it shows a, a way in down gaze. Someone um, put him in, in prisms, and that didn't really seem to help. Um, and uh, he doesn't have any, the vis vision is good with each eye, so he doesn't have any complaints about that. Ocular history is just significant for myopia and astigmatism. His medical history is interesting. He's had a pituit pituitary adenoma. This was diagnosed in 1985 on the basis of um, acromegaly symptoms. So his, his he actually went in and had grown a shoe size and a half in about a month and thought that was strange and mentioned it to his doctor. Um, and along with some other symptoms, was diagnosed with pituitary adenoma. Never had any visual field abnormalities. He's had visual field tests in the past, but it wasn't a very big one causing any mass effect. It was just causing some hormonal effects. And because of that, he had an uh, initial um, transphenoidal uh, resection, which wasn't successful. And they went back in a month later and just did a craniotomy um, and, and did a gross total resection. But because of uh, a small recurrence, he ended up having subsequent um, external beam radiation in uh, a year later. Um, and then since that time, he's been fine. Hasn't had any um, recurrences either on imaging or with surveillance um, hormonal lab lab work and, and he hasn't had any um, subsequent symptoms either until what's going on now. Other than the pituitary issues, just depression and arthritis, he takes medications including replacement pituitary hormones and then the rest of these are um, either just uh, supplements or, or for the arthritis. On exam, vision's good in each eye. He has a little bit of anisocoria where the left pupil is larger, but no APD. Color vision is normal. Stereo vision's pretty good. Normal pressure. Um, it's not proptotic. He does have left upper eyelid ptosis with a decreased levator function. It's about 12 millimeters in the left compared to the normal on the right. And hi his um, muscle balance exam shows that he has a left, a 12 prism diopter left hypotropia and an eight prism diopter exophoria. This is in primary gaze, and we, we couldn't test it in different gaze directions um, because it would cause him to go into this spasm, which changes his measurements drastically. So this was just in primary gaze. His motility was full in both eyes, except for a minus three deficiency of elevation in the left eye. And he had signs of uh, aberrant regeneration because when he looked down, his left upper eyelid retracted. And we'll see that some on the video. So this, this is uh, what happens on right gaze. So I think this was, we started the video right after he went into this spasm. So you know he had a little exophoria normally, but uh, when the 
this video starts, he'll already have a little bit of an ESO. And look to your right. And so you can see that um, now he has a little, uh, that was there before the, the deficiency of up gaze, but now that he's in the spasm, he has a new deficiency of abduction in the eye and much more um, deficiency of elevation and also this left upper lid retraction, which wasn't there before. And that, that explains the sensation of him having difficulty closing his eye during these spasms. And now he's really esotropic. Ignore that handsome guy in the mirror. I'm gonna show that one more time. So the, the main things here, before he was exophoric, now he's eso, and before he had left upper lid ptosis, and now he has left upper lid retraction and a deficiency of abduction, which wasn't there before. So this is just kind of what I, what I just showed. Left upper lid elevation, infraduction and adduction of the left eye are kind of what um, composes this, this spasm. And what it results in is an esotropia from what was an exophoria, um, greater restriction of up gaze, restriction of abduction, which, which wasn't present before, and, uh, and notably there was no change in his pupils when, when this spasm occurs. So we, we diagnosed him with a partial left third nerve palsy even in between episodes with aberrant regeneration. I don't, that video didn't really show. He has some left upper lid retraction on down gaze. Um, and the differential diagnosis, and then left ocular motor neuromyotonia, which the differential diagnosis of that um, or of the two in combination includes um, a cyclic esotropia, ocular motor paralysis with cyclic spasm. Um, not superior oblique myocardium doesn't really look like this, um, but I included it on there too, and myasthenia gravis. And I'm going to go through each one of these and, and talk about why this is neuromyotonia. The, the features really fit best with neuromyotonia. Um, it, it, this is an episodic condition. It's spontaneous or induced by various gaze positions, and it can occur years after um, whatever injury or insult that, that causes it, which we'll talk about. Um, it only rarely involves the pupil, as opposed to ocular motor paralysis with cyclic spasm, which always involves the pupil. Um, and this really happens in, in, in the first year of life. Um, you never have, with this condition, normal oculomotor function in between the spastic episodes, whereas in neuromyotonia, you could have totally normal um, function of that cranial nerve in between chronic episodes. Superior oblique myotonia doesn't look like this, but um, if you had a patient with a fourth nerve neuromyotonia, you might, um, there might be some overlap on the exam. Um, the big difference there is that the patients with myotonia have symptoms of oscillopsia and microtremor present on exam, um, in addition to the vertical deviation in the propia, which may also be present with my, uh, neuromyotonia. Cyclic esotropia also develops during childhood, um, and uh, consequently they don't, they don't usually have the propia. They don't have signs of cranial neuropathy in between their uh, episodes, and, um, and their, their cycles are more on the order of of hours to days, whereas neuromyotonia is like seconds to minutes. My senior grad doesn't look like anything, but the important thing here is that there's no pupil involvement, which with some of these other things there can be. So ocular neuromyotonia fits best with what this patient has. Um, it's previously been reported in only 45 patients um, since 1966, and, and uh, we already talked about it's been characteri it's characterized by periods of sustained involuntary contraction of, of one or more, usually one, um, extraocular muscles caused by spontaneous excitation of the nerves that control those muscles. The definitions here are, are important because um, uh, neuromyotonia is a pretty specific uh, entity. So myotonia is, is described as a de just a delay in muscle relaxation after a voluntary contraction, and that's from a muscle membrane disorder. Um, neurotonia is the same thing, except that's from a, an actual nerve disorder, so you have um, uh, repetitive neural discharges. And then neuromyotonia is neurotonia, but just accompanied by, instead of just delayed relaxation, it's accompanied by actual excessive contraction, um, either 
small contractions, fibrillations, and fasciculations, or an entire muscle group or an entire extraocular muscle. A re recent review um, of all the reported cases in the literature showed that in terms of ocular neuromyotonia, the most commonly affected cranial nerve is the third nerve, followed by the, uh, the sixth and the fourth. And then the most commonly reported associations um, or causes, depending on, on how you want to look at it, are prior cranial irradiation in, in um, almost half of the cases, which our patient had. Uh, and then a lot of other things that could potentially cause injury but not complete death of, of that cranial nerve. Um, and, then, and then rarely you can have a, there have been reported patients who have neuromyotonia without any identifiable prior cause. And then our patient's um, cause we thought was prior cranial irradiation. And this is a couple of representative images from his MRI scan. Um, which he had done uh, just uh, several months prior to our exam. Um, this is an axial CT just showing the course, the subarachnoid course of the third nerves here. Um, there wasn't any uh, tumor or mass effect on the nerves visible on the scans. Um, and then post contrast uh, axial and coronal, coronal images showing enhancement of the third nerves um, on both sides. And that enhancement was just thought to be um, you know, due to the pr prior irradiation. He didn't have any other signs of like a, an active meningeal process going on. The pathophysiology, um, no, we don't really know, but the prior um, electromyographic studies point toward this being a neurogenic disorder rather than a myogenic disorder. Uh, the theories um, are based on either this being um, a peripheral nerve origin or a central or nuclear origin. And I'm going to focus on the peripheral nerve origin um, based on uh, the fact that it, I think it makes a little more sense. Um, this uh, paper down here described uh, a possible mechanism of how this may uh, occur based on, on theories of what happens um, in peripheral nerves after injury. There's three things that have been described to happen in peripheral nerves after injury. Um, this ataxic transmission is, is crosstalk between adjacent axons. So instead of the, the impulse going this way, it actually, um, in, into, another, um, into another neuron, it actually can crosstalk between adjacent axons and, and nerves that have been damaged. Um, reflection or antidromic conduction is just the impulse traveling the wrong way up the nerve after injury. And then Proximal sprouting or branching of axons it just describes just what it sounds like. You have in, um, in, in the process of regrowing the axon, they can come off more proximal, um, and you end up with multiple axons coming off in, in parallel. And what that can cause is it can set up this, um, so if you have the ability to have the impulse travel the opposite direction and you have multiple axons that can crosstalk with each other, then you can set up this reverberating circuit it's similar to what's seen in, in cardiac re-entry tachycardias, like in Wolf, Parkinson, White, and that can just cause a really amplified, intense signal um, that when it is transmitted to the muscle, you know, can cause a sustained contraction and delayed relaxation. And, uh, and this is, I think, supported a little bit by the fact that in a lot of these patients who have had cranial nerve injury, um, they can have aberrant regeneration, which can also be explained by this proximal axon sprouting. Um, and g you know, going to, to a different location. Um, and there's been a lot of patients who, including our patient with neuromyotonia, who have been described to have aberrant regeneration also. So that supports, I think, this, this uh, possible mechanism. The treatment, um, carbamazepine is, has worked well in a lot of patients, um, as well as other anti-epileptic drugs. The membrane, carbamazepine is a um, so sodium channel blocker and uh, most uh, other anti-epileptic medications um, are membrane stabilizing medications and that also supports the, the pathophysiology that, that we talked about. There was one, there was one patient um, that was reported in the British Medical Journal last year who actually had ocular neuromyotonia and found relief from no medications and the only thing that ever helped her was wearing these goggles um, which she stole from her grandson. Th these are Bob the Builder goggles, um, which Bob the Builder actually doesn't wear goggles. 
I don't know where that came from, but they were they were described as Bob the Builder goggles, and the authors thought that so she had the her neuromyotonia was induced by lateral gaze, and they thought that because she tried other goggles, she tried swimming goggles and, and you know tight safety goggles, and this was the only thing that worked, and so she just wore this around. So they thought that it blocked enough of her peripheral vision that she didn't have the impulse to look to the side, and then she didn't go into spasm. So she just walked around wearing these all the time. So in conclusion, um, and so our patient, um, we, start, we started him on, um, I think we recommended starting gabapentin, and I don't know if we've been seeing him follow up yet or not, but um, Dr. Warner says no. So in conclusion, ocular neuromyotonia, it's an uncommon but pretty unmistakable condition when you see it. It um, doesn't really look like anything else. Occasionally, I think that maybe if you had a, a fourth nerve neuromyotonia, it could overlap a little bit with myotonia, but um, the features of, of this are pretty different than a lot of other things that you might um, mistake it for. The associations are usually with things that injure or irritate cranial nerves, and, and therefore these patients deserve neuroimaging. Um, most commonly, it's prior irradiation, and uh, they can be successfully treated with anti-epileptic medications or um, goggles, Bob Builder goggles. So I'd like to thank the patient for letting me video him, um, external beam radiation for making this possible, and the neuro-ophthalmology faculty, both for helping with this presentation and for, uh, for everything. This is my last neuro-ophthalmology presentation. So. And I also just wanted to. Yeah, it's terrible, and it happens. Can you see the um, impaired abduction with that also? I mean, if there is a, spa is a spasm. Yeah. Great. Any other questions or comments? No, just, you know, for your information only. <laughs> September 3rd, Missouri State. <laughs> the younger, handsomer President, Governor Clinton, probably. <laughs>